Hello, and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa, and this is episode six. I'm pretty glad that I followed through on what I said I was gonna do last time, and I'm recording now exactly two weeks after the last time I recorded. So I'm hoping that this new schedule is going to allow me to get in depth a little bit more than I have in the past and sort of focus on a fewer number of projects, but be able to tell you a little bit more about each of them. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed so far. I really appreciate you coming back time after time. And if you're new, if you're a new subscriber, welcome. Before I get into the meat of this podcast, I want to talk about what I'm wearing because I always forget that. So this is the Ellery by Elizabeth Doherty. So let me just stand up. This was the subject of my first project diary, which is a sort of making of series that I like to do. And I will link that both above and below. I did a number of modifications. You can see it is a pretty short cropped length. I'm wearing a tennis skirt on the bottom because it is too hot to be cute below the waist. You can see there's a little bit of an underarm gusset there. And I did not do sleeves because I did not have enough yarn, like not at all for doing this project. So more details are in the project diary. The first project I wanna talk about today is my newest work in progress, which is the Red Edge sweater by Annalisa Monheimer Loon, who was a designer in the collective Bohu Stickning, which I talked a little bit about last week. I'm knitting the version of the pattern that comes in this book, Poems of Color by Wendy Keel, which was written in 1995. And it has a number of sort of recreations of the original Bohu's designs in a slightly larger gauge. So I figured this was sort of a good place to start if I wanted to make one of these Bohu sweaters. The red edge, which is the pattern I'm making, is this one. This is one of the earlier Bohus designs. It's unclear to me exactly what year it was designed because I saw 1949 and then I also saw references to it a little bit earlier. So sometime in the 40s was when this pattern was designed. The things that I found appealing about this design initially were the number of colors involved. I knew that I wasn't gonna get bored making it. And I also really liked the graphic nature of all of these motifs. Um, a lot of them are sort of elongated lines and like elongated diamonds and, using more than two colors in a row, which I hadn't done a whole lot before, but seemed like it would be interesting. And I also really like the use of a lot of the pearl stitches throughout the design. So let me give you a little close up of this. Might be a little bit hard to see in the photo, but there is a lot of pearl texture used throughout a lot of these colored bands here. On the last episode, I mentioned that I was going to make the cardigan and I had cast on the back piece. So the back and the fronts were to be knitted separately from the bottom up. I had cast on the back and I had knit my three inches of rib and was just planning on starting with the back to sort of get it out of the way and have some plain Zoom meeting or TV knitting. Here is my progress on this so far. And I think last time I showed you, I was, I had just finished this ribbing. So I've got, you know, I don't know, six more inches that I've done. As I was editing the last episode, I decided, you know, let me take a look at my pattern, make sure I've got all of my colors lined up correctly that I need for the front and just make sure I have what I need. The way this book is structured is similar to the original Bohus designs. You would have a design that was repeated across garments and accessories. So like you could get a version of the red edge in a pullover or a cardigan or mittens or maybe a hat or a scarf, you know, something like that. So they would just put this pattern on a whole bunch of different things. And that's how this book is written. So when I started this, the back of this, what I thought was gonna be the cardigan, I just started at the top of this pattern. And I'm gonna hold it back so you can't actually see the whole thing, but this is the entire pattern here on this one page, other than the chart, obviously. Since I just started at the top, I started doing the pullover. And the cardigan is actually written to have one inch of rib around the bottom. I had already done three inches of rib and probably three or four more inches of the back before I realized what I had done. And so I was like, okay, pullover it is. After I had this realization, I sort of felt like that makes more sense for my style anyway. The cardigan version of this sweater, especially the like 1995 rewritten version of this was maybe gonna be a little bit hard for me to pull off in terms of my personal style, like how this is going to fit into the rest of my wardrobe. But the pullover version, I think is gonna be a little bit easier for me to incorporate into my, my other clothes and wear with other things. So no problem, right? 
I had gotten a couple inches into the back, and then it occurred to me that I really didn't want to knit the entire back, including the armhole shaping. There's a little bit of underarm shaping, really not much at all. But I wanted to make sure that that underarm shaping for the back was going to match up with whatever I did on the front. And I wasn't entirely sure if my gauge on the front was going to be very consistent because I had never knitted color work flat, which is the other sort of new experience that I was going to be having with this project. So I decided, you know, let me start the front and I'll get a little bit of the way into the body and sort of see how it's going. You know, maybe I can get up to the armholes in the next month or so and then I'll know exactly how long to knit my back piece between the bottom of the rib and the underarm so that it will match with the front. So once I got started with the color work, here is what happened. <laughs> uh... Yep, I knit the entire front like a mad woman. I had so much fun knitting this. And yes, it is color work knit entirely flat. And I loved it. I couldn't put it down. I completed this in a little over a week, which I definitely wasn't expecting. And I actually had like a little bit of a letdown after I was done with it. Like I, I was a little bit despondent on my other projects for a couple days because they were not nearly as interesting as doing the front of this sweater. So let me talk you through this. So you start off with the same three inches of rib as the back of the sweater, which I had done before. Then there is a little bit of texture right off the bat. And these are just basically X's in purl stitches, but it just creates this little band. And then this color work here is sort of in color work and on a larger scale, a reflection of what this texture pattern is. I really, this is what sort of started to get me excited because I could see how cool this design process was. Like it looks so weird, right? Like there are so many weird unrelated patterns. None of these motifs repeat um, in any real significant way. And you would think that that would look just like a hodgepodge. And maybe this does look like a hodgepodge to some of you. Like this style is definitely a little bit out there, but there are relations between the motifs in a more complex way than I was anticipating initially. For this being my first real uh, go at knitting color work flat, th these patterns that have a lot of vertical lines in them are actually not the greatest for learning color work in general. Um, it, you know, it looks like it's a simple pattern because it's simple to follow it with your eyes, but it's not simple to get consistent tension across a pattern like this. So in a lot of ways, it was a good exercise for me to learn the knitting tension on the purl side um, through doing this little motif. So after that we have another band of the same texture and then we go into this garter band which has some color work in it as well. These little blips of color are created by doing a row of color work, you know, one by one color work on the right side. So like this row right here is one by one blue and yellow color work across. Then on the wrong side, you knit back in one color. So I think this one, you know, after you did this, you knit back in the blue and then it creates these little color work garter bumps. Then this next motif is the first time in the sweater where you're holding more than two colors at a time. Actually, you're holding four colors going across the row, which was epic. I had never tried this before. So you can see we've got white, red, blue, and then there's two stitches of the this back, background brown color. And so what I actually decided to do here was to work the row twice. I don't remember which two I chose to go together, but I'm going to put some video as I'm talking that shows exactly how I did this. But I held two of the colors and I knit across the row. So you knit, you know, I chose like four, a four stitch grouping and I only used those two colors going across the row. So I think I paired the blue and the brown on one row and then I used the white and the red on another row. And so what I did was I used my usual two handed color work knitting style to do this. And then I would just slip these four stitches that were going to be done on the next row. So I basically did blue, blue, brown, brown, and then slip four. 
blue, blue, brown, brown slip for. Then I pushed all my stitches back as if I was going to start a new row, uh, going the same direction I had just gone. And I picked up my white and red and I did the same thing where I knit the stitches that were supposed to be white and red. And then I slipped the four blue and brown stitches that I had done previously on just the previous row. Here is what the back looks like, which is relatively organized float wise. I didn't catch my floats on any part of this entire front of the sweater, partially because the book says that it was not traditional in Bohu's knitting to do that. And also partially because it was just too complicated um, <laughs> to try to figure out where to catch the floats in some of these patterns and with some of these colors and with this type of yarn, which is a sticky fingering weight Shetland yarn, um, longer floats are not going to be a problem. So then after that, we have this little section of some more two color color work. Again, you know, you can see this really isn't the best for having good tension, like these types of very vertical, where there are lots of stitches in line with each other like that, but this is gonna block out. I'm not worried about that. And then we have these like weird little caterpillars. <laughs> I don't know what else you would call these. They look like caterpillars to me. This is, you know, one of those things that I had found appealing. This, These weird little textured stitches in color work are just so unusual. Now at this point, with the way this pattern is written, it's a very old school pattern, which I appreciate, but it means that you have to read ahead to make sure that you're making the right decisions. The thing that the pattern doesn't specify is when in the color chart you want to start that underarm shaping in order to have that red band sit in a nice place on your chest. And I understand why, because it makes the pattern writing a lot simpler. Uh, and also because not everybody is going to be the same in that area. You know, some people might want it to hit a little higher or lower. And so I did a lot of perusing Ravelry projects for this pattern. The thing to note if you are looking at these or interested in making one of these is that there are two sort of licensed versions of the pattern. One is in this Poems of Color book, and the other one is the original Bohus sweater pattern, which is being produced and yarn kits being made by somebody in Sweden. And so the actual patterns are different because they're written at different gauges, but because both of these patterns are a little bit old school, there's no real good connection between them in Ravelry. So you sort of have to search for the designer and then look at both of those two patterns. So I did that. I looked at both the Poems of Color versions and the like more traditional Bohus versions to see exactly where people were starting that underarm shaping and then where that red band was hitting on their chest. I ended up starting the underarm shaping just after I had joined the red yarn to do this red band. I really didn't know if that was exactly the right place, um, but I had to make a decision at that point and go for it because I didn't, what I didn't want to have happen was to start the arm hole too late and then the red band would be like either right across the apex or like maybe even a little bit under the bust. That was what I really wanted to avoid. So I feel like this was probably the latest I could have started it. Um, if I had started it a little bit further down, this red band would be up higher on my chest. And then I would be in danger of not being able to do the rest of the pattern above the red band. So it was sort of, I had some angst over trying to figure that out, but uh, like with everything else, you just have to make a decision at some point and go for it. And I think on me, this is going to be fine. Like here's the apex, so it's just right above. Most of this section is actually two color, color work, except for just a couple rows in here and a couple rows in here. But it's still a really effective use of that three color color work without having to do a whole ton of it. And it's also emphasized by these purl stitches in this white yarn, which is actually not white. It's the same color as the main color of the body, which is more of like a light tan, but against this darker yarn, it looks white. And this, I just love, like these little purl stitches add so much. It would be a completely different look if those were just knit stitches. After that, there's a little bit more playing with garter and color work together. 
and another thick garter band. This is the part where I'm not super sure I love this, um, especially these like red and yellow, you know, ketchup and mustard colors together. I'm not super sure about that. But then when you get further away, it's sort of less noticeable and a little bit less offensive. And then we have an echo of the, the previous motif that looks similar to this, but is a little bit different. And this, the caterpillar motif. At this point in the pattern, there is supposed to be another band of textured stitches like at the very beginning, this, this texture here. And so I stopped here just because I'm not entirely sure that I was getting gauge at this point. And um, by that, I mean row gauge. The armhole shaping of this sweater is a little bit of a cross between a set in sleeve and a drop shoulder. And so if I were going to knit the sleeves as written, I would also knit the sleeves from the bottom up and sort of shape the top of the sleeve head and then fit that the sleeve head into this armhole opening that I created um, after sewing the shoulders together with the back piece, right? There would be a, you'd probably sew it in flat and then sew the side seam down. And so if you're not getting row gauge on your body of your sweater, this distance here where this armhole shaping is, is going to be either too long or too short. Um, to have that sleeve head fit appropriately into the hole that's created. I think my row gauge is a little bit long in this area, and so I stopped before doing that last motif just because I don't want my armhole to be too big. And the reason for that is because if the armhole is too big, so if this is up at the top of my shoulder where it should be, and this is about, I don't know, an inch and a half below my actual armpit. If this is much lower than this and the armhole is too big, not only will the sleeve not fit into it if I have to sew the sleeve in, but it's going to really hinder my movement. It's sort of counterintuitive, but if the sleeve opening is too big, you're not going to be able to move your arm as well. You really need the sleeve opening to be closer to your armpit in order to have that full range of motion with your arm. It's less of an issue for oversized sweaters or unusual sweater shapes, you know, that sort of doesn't apply as much. But for a more traditional sweater shape, having your armhole be too deep can be a problem. The yarn that I'm using for this is Jameson's of Shetland. All of the colors are Jameson's of Shetland. And I barely used some of these colors on this thing. Um, I have a lot of leftover yarn. Like it doesn't even look like I made a sweater. Um, the only the only colors that are uh, being used in any quantity on the front of this are um, this red and this green and to some extent this tan. All of the rest of them, it's like I have full skeins of yarn. Uh, they are the little 25 gram skeins, so I'll definitely use them again in the future. I knew this was going to happen, so this isn't a surprise, but it still looks a little bit ridiculous. I do love the yarn. I've used it a bunch of times before. It's very nice, traditional colorwork fingering weight yarn. You really can't go wrong with using this. It's great for beginners if you're trying to learn colorwork uh, because the stickiness of the yarn will help your stitches look more consistent once everything is blocked. Complaints. So there are 12 colors in this pattern and I am not going to show the whole chart, but I'm just gonna show you how the colors appear in the book. The way that they have all of these charts done throughout the book is with colors instead of symbols. So the charts are in full color, but with 12 different colors, it is actually really not easy to tell which one is which in the chart. So here's how they all appear. And I am fairly certain that I confused these three colors here at some point. And uh, this burnt umber and this chestnut color, uh, which were the original yarn colors, um, they look pretty different right here. But when you're actually looking at them in the chart and they're not right next to each other, it's not super easy to tell which is which. Like I could not, it would get to a certain point in the day where it was too dark for me to be able to tell which color was which. Um, I had to look at it in like full on natural light from the sun. I couldn't even use a, a good lamp inside my house at night. I'm not sure how many of these colors you really need. I think I probably could have gotten away with at least one less of those teal 
green type colors because I definitely misread the chart at some point and I realized it at the very end and I was like, let me throw that color in that I haven't used yet since I bought a skein of it and should have used it at some earlier point that I can't tell because my eyes are too bad. This other thing that I've been thinking is not a complaint, but more of a thought that I'm glad that I stopped and knitted the front of this because my instinct would have been to just note what row I ended up doing this armhole shaping on and do the same thing on the back. But what I wouldn't have been taking into consideration is that all of these rows that are garter rows actually end up squishing the gauge for that little section. So this row gauge right here is tighter than row gauge of either just plain stockinette or any of this regular color work. So it's not really a one for one relationship at those garter ridges when you're sewing the sides together. With the amount, I mean, there's not that much of that sort of texture happening in the body, but I might be able to get away with knitting a few fewer rows on the body piece to be able to match the distance from the bottom of the hem to the underarm on the back piece. The other thought I'm having is that I think I am going to do the sleeves from the top down just because I'm not 100% sure about my gauge at that armhole. And I'm gonna wait until I get the back piece done or close to being done and then take a look at it and see what I think. If I can make a bottom up sleeve fit neatly into whatever the size that armhole is, then I might go for it, but it also feels at this point like it's going to be an easier task to, once I have that armhole with both the front and the back joined, I can just pick up stitches around that armhole, do a little bit of short rowing for the shoulder, and then knit the sleeve from the top down. I don't love doing that when the sweater has been knit from the bottom up, and this seems like a ridiculous thing, but the stitches when you're knitting bottom up look like this. And the stitches when you're knitting top down look like this. And it's going to matter less in a sweater like this because the arms are plain. So that's sort of why I'm considering doing it. It bothers me a little bit that whatever I do at the cuff will look slightly different if I'm knitting from the top down, right? Like a, a bind off at the cuff is gonna look different than a cast on at the cuff if it's knitted from the bottom up. So that's where I'm at on the red edge at the moment. Now I just have mind numbing knitting to go. So I'm gonna have to force myself to get through it a little bit. I don't know how long it will take me to get through it. Um, I'm worried about it being a little bit of a slog from this point on, but we will see. I had a request to show a couple of the other designs that are represented in the book as patterns. So let me just show you a couple of those. This is the blue shimmer yoke, which I also love. I would love to make this one in the original version with like the Angora yarns. This is the wild apple which is the design that got me turned on to Bohus in the first place. I love the colors in this one so pretty. Styling, a little bit questionable. This is the large collar jacket, and so in these styles, the fronts were knitted side to side, so they were knitted, you cast on this way, knit out both sides, and then the sleeves and the back were knitted normally, um, so from bottom up, I think and then everything was seamed, which is uh, really interesting. I would like to try that out and see just how the construction works at some point, but this is way too long. Um, I would either need to be longer than this to be like a dramatic sort of coat style or short, I would need to crop it. Yeah, there's something about this length that's just a little bit too dated for me. There are a few others, but what you'll see in a lot of these patterns is that they didn't bother making a garment. They must have just made a swatch. So like here, the shield, right? Like they, there's no photo of a garment or accessory for this. And I just have no idea what this is supposed to look like on a sweater. Like, does this motif repeat? Is the rest of the sweater plain? You know, and I know that I could easily find that out by reading the pattern, but it's just not the most compelling uh, way to choose your next garment, you know? I know that with the goal of this book having been to sort of recreate the Bohus patterns, I could probably Google for that actual Bohus pattern, like the OG version and see what it looked like and assume that this one is gonna look relatively similar, but that's just like something to note. 
it would have been pretty epic for them to do garments for every single one of the patterns that's represented in this book. Here's another one that's just represented as a swatch. This is Dean. And I actually really like this one. I do think you can tell from this swatch, you can get a, a relatively good representation of what the sweater, a, a yoke especially, is going to look like with that. I think other people have felt the same way too because there are a number of examples of this on Ravelry. So that is that project. The only other project I've been working on these past couple of weeks is the test knit that I'm doing for Soft Power Knits, and it is the Blueberry Pie sweater. So let me show you where I'm at with that. Last time I think I was just at the armhole separation. So I have finished the body, which I made quite cropped, and I finished one sleeve this morning. So it's a little bit of a balloon sleeve, which is an edit that I made to the pattern with the designer's permission. So the last episode I was debating what to do about the depth of the yoke because I had gotten to the bottom of where I was supposed to separate for the sleeves and realized that it was a little bit too short. So I hemmed and hawed over that for a little while. And then I realized because I didn't fully know how this yarn was going to react to blocking that maybe I should just block the yoke and see what happens. Because I was working this on interchangeable needles, I was able to just take the needles off the ends of my cords, put some stoppers on and then throw the entire yoke into a, a little bath with some wool wash. I took it out and just laid it out like I would ordinarily block the sweater. And then I just, that was when I knit the entire front of the, the red edge. The yarn that I'm using for this is um, Blue Sky Fibers Alpaca Silk, which is a sport weight. This is in the sapphire colorway. And I'm holding that together with Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair in the Bordeaux colorway. Because I was using such a weird combination, I had never, I've combined mohair with a lot of things before, but I had never combined it with alpaca silk, which is just super drapey, like, there is no memory whatsoever in this yarn. It's just gonna drape all day long. I didn't know exactly how much that yoke might stretch out, which is why I decided to block it. Turns out it was a good thing I did because after blocking, it was in exactly the right place for me to split for the sleeves. I did end up shifting the sleeves just slightly forward to accommodate my broad back and small chest. And so now it fits perfectly. The pattern is going to come with a cropped option. I knitted mine a little bit shorter than the cropped option even because I think that this this is probably going to stretch out a little bit as well and so I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to be too long after blocking. Then for the sleeves I ended up making some changes. The pattern when it's published is going to have a cable continuing down the outside of the the arm. So at the time I was knitting my first sleeve there was an option in the testing group to lengthen the sleeves uh, but there was not an option to shorten the sleeves. And the reason that this was important is because this cable pattern continued down the arm like this, if I had just tried to do that pattern as it was written and then just end the sleeve earlier, one of these uh, diamonds would have gotten cut off. You know, like it was supposed to come down to a point at the bottom of the cuff and then there's a little cuff pattern and then you do some rib. If I had just tried to cut it off without altering the rest of the pattern, it would have ended that diamond in a weird place and it wouldn't have made sense with what was coming afterwards. So what I could have done, and I think what the designer is planning to do, is to change the width of these diamonds for a shorter sleeve option. So you have sort of a smaller diamond that takes fewer rows and then you'll have a shorter sleeve. So instead of doing that, um, the cables down the outside of the sleeves, while very beautiful, are not exactly my style. I just did that on the Sawyer pullover, which I finished um, in the last episode. There was something about it that was just a little bit much. Like I wanted to have a slightly simpler look at the bottom of the sweater. And so I just continued knitting. I made zero decreases in the sleeve the pattern is going to have decreases for a more normal sleeve shape than this. Um, a little bit more tapered sleeve shape. And then I did one row down here where I decreased the sleeve stitches by almost half. I think I went from 62 to 32 stitches here. And then I did some two by two rib to match the bottom of the sweater and also the neckline. And I did have to do this twice because <laughs> As soon as I, well, I maybe had done like five or six rows of one by one ribbing because I just wasn't thinking. And 
I realized it and I was like, is that going to bother me? And I sort of stood back and looked at it. And the two by two rib is actually a pretty major component of the design. And it just didn't look right having like two by two rib up here and at the bottom and then having one by one on the sleeve. So whatever, I ripped it out and did the two by two. I'm still in love with the weird color that those two yarns together are creating. My husband is calling this my mint chocolate chip sweater, <laughs> which I think is funny, but he doesn't usually take notice of my knitting. So I think um, he must like this one. So that's where I'm at on this one. I have one more sleeve to go. I'm way ahead of schedule for the test knit. So I feel okay about getting this done in time. Also, I've now gone off pattern. So my, uh, what I can bring as far as feedback to the test net is limited now. I think the hard part was really at the yoke and all of these traveling cables were relatively complicated for her to write out. They weren't complicated to do, but it must have been a pretty epic feat to actually like write the pattern in an understandable way. So once I got past that, I was like, okay, you know, things are good. That brings me to my upcoming plans. So I had talked about doing the Fleuriste sweater by Sari Nordland, and I am still planning to do that. I swatched for it, but I don't want to have a plain, so the body and arms of that sweater are plain and it's knitted from the bottom up. And I don't want to have that going on simultaneously with all of the plain knitting on the red edge because I'm just never going to be able to get through it. I won't want to work on either one. So I have to wait until I'm done with the red edge before I start on the fleuriste. But I got so pumped up doing the color work for the red edge that it feels like I just need to do another color work project. Like that's where I'm at mentally. So I'm just going to go with it. Those of you who've been watching for a little while will know that I am a fan of Marie Wallen. Who isn't, right? And I had gotten her Wildwood book after admiring the patterns, like since they came out. I've basically been obsessed with the book for a while, but I just hadn't ordered it because I wasn't ready to start making anything from it. I ordered this a few months ago. And basically everything in the book has this very ethereal, woodsy, autumnal palette. And I think this might have been her first book where she was working with the British Breeds yarn, which is her own yarn line that she designed. I think it's being milled by John Arbin. I think. Yes, it's being milled by John Arbin. And here are the colors. I think they've added a couple more colors since this book came out, but... Um, so the book was basically to showcase this yarn, which is really pretty. So I wanted to also try out the yarn recommended for this project. I had not used the British Breeds before. I had never even seen it in person, but I was able to order it from the Woolly Thistle and get all of the colors that I needed except for one. I guess I should show you what I'm planning to make before I get into the yarn. I have been obsessing over this since the book came out. This is the Oak pattern and it is so pretty. I love this shape of, I love an open front cardigan, first of all. And I also love this shape where it's sort of wider at the bottom and then decreases towards the neck. And yeah, I just love it. So I've been wanting to make this cardigan since this book came out and I ordered the exact colors. So in theory, the one that I make will look just like this one in the book. Hopefully it will look as good on me as it does on this beautiful model. We'll see. Um, my concerns at this point are the pattern is written to be knitted flat and I, even though I've had such a good time knitting the red edge, I'm planning on making a lot of changes to the construction of this. I'm perplexed by this. I have to say, um, maybe somebody who's watching can help me figure out why this is. A lot of Marie Wallen's color work patterns, like very detailed color work patterns are written in this way to be worked flat and then sewn together in pieces. And I understand that the reason for this is because she used to be a designer at Rowan and Rowan's sort of style sheet for their designs is that they wanted the color work to be written knitted flat because that's what they felt their customers would be comfortable with for whatever reason. And I would really like to know exactly when that sort of market became the most comfortable knitting color work flat. Because from what I know, most traditional Fair Isle designs are knitted in the round. Like steaking was not a foreign thing. And I was wondering at first if this was like a make do and mend thing. Like if it was a you know, make do and mend during World War II and the years after when clothing and yarn and animal fibers were rationed, 
if it was like people didn't want to steek because they wanted to be able to reuse the yarn. That's a complete hypothesis. I haven't read this anywhere, but I would love to know exactly what the deal is there because it's not easier to knit it flat. Um, it might make the finishing a little bit better looking. I'm about to find out if that's true with the red edge because that was the reason given in the Bohu's book for why things were knitted flat. A lot of the time was because it made a nicer inside. It was like a couture thing. Um, they wanted the inside seams to be neater and with a steek, they would be less neat. Not to say that steeks can't be neatly finished on the inside. It might not be as crisp as a seam without a steek. But now Marie Wallen is not a, employed by Rowan anymore and she's an independent designer and can use whatever yarns she wants and design however she wants. But a lot of her stuff is still written flat. I'm assuming that's because now there's a market of people who do know how to knit color work flat and she's catering in some part to that market. A lot of the designs are also steeked. Like this book has a mix of steeked and knit flat designs, which I find to be really interesting. But with this one knitted flat, I think I want to change that. I'm glad that I've had the experience of knitting color work flat, but it's not the most enjoyable thing. Like knitting color work in the round for me is just complete enjoyment the entire time. I did enjoy the pearl rose a little bit less on the red edge. Um, I didn't hate it, but I wasn't like, yes, let me do this pearl side row, you know? So I am going to convert this pattern to be knitted in the round. And that is not as straightforward as it would be with a lot of other designs, which I realized as soon as I took a look at the chart. The chart in the book for this pattern is actually the entire back. Ordinarily, when you see a color work chart, you'd see, you know, a certain amount of stitches that needed to be repeated throughout the row or round, whatever you're doing. But when I looked at the chart for this one, it's like this big because it's the entire back of the garment. And when I started looking a little bit more closely at the motifs in the sweater, I, I think I see why that is. You can identify the motifs more easily in the photo than you can in the chart because Marie Wallen's charts are written with symbols for each color, which I actually appreciate because then you don't have the same issue that I'm having with the red edge pattern where I can't tell the colors apart. Um, but it's a little bit harder to identify just visually which where the one motif ends and the other one begins. And it's even less apparent on this sweater because we have these sort of little, um, here we have some V's that are almost like picots, and here we have some little, um, you know, a little cross motif that comes down. So it sort of blends the motifs into each other in a way that is a little bit unusual for, um, I don't even want to call this Fair Isle because it's not exactly Fair Isle style. Like I think this is inspired more by Eastern European designs. But if you had just straight bands, it would be a little bit easier to see where the motif ended. But the other thing is these motifs are really long. The repeats of each stitch pattern are, are long, like, you know, 24 stitches and 20 stitches and, you know, etc. So I, when I'm looking at the motifs, I'm seeing like, here's one, here's one, here. This one I'm sort of counting as a whole, this, all this green motif and then starts repeating again. So when I'm thinking about combining the back and the fronts so that I can knit them in the round, it's not as straightforward to just extend the motif by looking at a pattern repeat because there is no pattern repeat in the in the chart that's provided. It's the entire back of the garment. I hope this makes sense, but like the lowest common denominator of this stitch pattern and this one and this one and this one doesn't exist in the amount of stitches that you would need to go all the way around this garment. I emailed Marie Wallen to see if she would send me the uh, digital version of the chart because I knew I was gonna have to mess with it and she sent it to me right away, which was really nice. I think what I'm going to do is take that back chart and I don't know, either cut it out or somehow copy and paste the side charts onto it. I'm gonna need to take that chart for the back. So I'm, I'm making the medium size, right? So I'll take the medium chart for the back. I'm gonna have to extend it around for the number of stitches that I need for each left and right front to make sure that there's no jog in the side where the seam would be. Because if I just go by where it's indicated in this pattern where I need to start the front if I were knitting it flat, there would be a jog. It's not lined up exactly with the side of the back in the pattern. So there would be like a weird jog. 
I thought about trying to get around that by doing a faux side seam, like do a purl stitch in that, uh, you know, add a stitch on each side and then do a purl stitch. I might do that if the chart redrawing thing ends up being too much of an issue, um, but that's my plan B. Here is a selection of the yarn that I am going to use, which is exactly the yarn called for in the pattern. It's really pretty. Jewel tones, um, the label is lovely, the colors are really heathered, which I appreciate. Look at this purple. Oof. Love it. The one color that I couldn't get when I was ordering all of these other ones, uh, the one that was out of stock, is the natural color. And so I am substituting just some Jameson and Smith, uh, what is this? Shetland Supreme Jumper Weight. And this is color number 2006. Very similar to what I'm using in the red edge for the main color. I'm really looking forward to starting that. And I had told myself that I needed to finish the first sleeve on the test knit before I could start on the oak cardigan. So now that I have done that, as of this morning, I am probably gonna cast on for my new project. I'm gonna have to ration this project because I know that it's just gonna take all of my attention. I'm not gonna wanna work on the plain back or arms of the red edge. I'm probably not gonna wanna work on the, the test knit anymore because it's mohair and it's like so hot, it's so hot. I'm just sweating just sitting here and touching that sweater right now is not super fun. So maybe that's like an early morning knitting project before it gets too hot and then I can switch over to the Marie Wallen. So I think that's all I have for this episode. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.